I'd like to say um, that the graphs are great, but the best way to understand a QTL scan is to actually write the summary reports. So here's a little bit of R code. I'm, I'm calculating the, the main scan, the scan one for single QTLs, and I'm going to write a summary report. I'm going to use some permutations that I ran, and I'm going to use a 0.05 significance level, and my report shows me that there's a chromosome 1 QTL and a chromosome 4 QTL. The chromosome 4 QTL has a nice big LOD score. Its position is at about 29.5 centimorgans. The chromosome 1 with a slightly smaller LOD score, the best peak is at 49. And that's all the main scan told me, chromosome 1 and chromosome 4. But when I did the all pairs genome scan, the R command shown here, and I summarize it. Well, for starters, I see that the chromosome 1 and chromosome 4 come up again, but I also see chromosome 6 and chromosome 15 coming up. And I'd like to walk you through briefly, and we'll have to revisit this, how I decipher this report, because it's not easy. The first thing I want you to notice is that um, there's a position 1F for the full model, and there's a position 1A for the additive model. The QTL peaks for the full model and the additive model might not be at the same place. That's interesting to keep in mind, but um, if I look at chromosome 1 and chromosome 4, I see that they have a really big full LOD score. That's the first thing I'll look at. It's got a big full LOD. Then I'm going to look at the interaction, 0 0.259. There's really not much evidence for those two QTLs to interact, and that's a clue for me to move over to the other half of the diagram where I can see the additive LOD score. That's, that's really big. That's almost as big as the full LOD score. And remember these nice parallel lines, they do fit an additive model, so I'm not surprised after having looked at the picture. And this is the additive versus one. Do I need two additive QTLs or do I need one? And that's six, and they're all big values. What's a big value? Well, I use these guidelines from the Broman and Sen book. The full LOD score should be bigger than six, the full versus one, the interaction, the add and the AV1. These are all your benchmarks for a back cross. The inner cross numbers are different and they're higher. So I went through C14 and I'm going to conclude that at these positions I have a nice additive QTL and I'm mainly basing that on the absence of a high interaction LOD score. Now when I look at 6 and 15 3.9. Well, it doesn't quite cut the 4.4, but it's pretty close, so I'm going to pay a lot of attention to the interaction here. The full LOD score, well, it's not as big as the other one, but it's big enough for me to be interested in, and because there's a big interaction, I'm going to say that this is an interacting pair, and I'm going to locate them at position 62 for chromosome 6 and position 17.5 for chromosome 15. I'm not even going to pay attention to the additive part of the model. That's how I interpret the SCAN2 summary. The capstone of this uh, QTL analysis is to look at everything simultaneously together. And to do that, I'm going to describe a, a QTL multiple QTL model fit. I'm going to say that the blood pressure Y is described by a QTL on chromosome 1, plus chromosome 4, plus 6, plus 15, plus the interaction between 6 and 15. The mechanics of doing that in RQTL, first I have to make something called an RQTL, or a QTL object. I use the make QTL function. I tell it which cross to look at, which chromosomes to look at, and which locations to grab on those chromosomes. And I got all that information from my summary reports. And then I'm going to fit the QTL model, and I'm going to use this formula here. 
and the formula numbers one, two, three, four actually correspond to the first, second, third, and fourth positions in my QTL model. So you may notice a little notational difference between my cartoon model and the actual command that I have to type in to RQTL to make it fit. Having fit the model, I'm going to summarize that fit. This is a big table. It tells me a lot of things. For example, that I used the imputation method, that there were 250 animals. It uh, spits back the formula at me, and it gives me something called an analysis of variance table. There are a lot of things in this table, but the thing I usually look at here is something called the percent variance explained. This tells me that 31% of the variance is explained by the combination of these four QTLs plus their interaction. That's all these things taken together explain 30% of the variance. For hypertension, for blood pressure, that's pretty good because it's a pretty noisy measurement. I really have captured a lot of the variability here in a single genetic model. And the bottom part is something called the drop one QTL table. So this tells me if I went through that model and one at a time I removed one of those terms, uh, what would happen? There's a little caveat though, and that is if I try to remove the Q6 term, the Q6 by 15 interaction no longer makes any sense. I can't say that two things interact if one of them isn't a QTL. So actually if I drop Q6 I have to drop them both. And that's why if I have um, dropped Q1 or Q4 I'm dropping one term from the model. But if I drop 6 or 15 I'm dropping two terms from the model. However I can just drop the interaction and keep 6 and 15. So this is what happens if I drop the interaction. What I'd like to see for every one of these is that if I drop it out, I lose some of my explanatory power. If I drop out chromosome 1, my percent variance explained is going to drop by 7%. I certainly don't want to drop chromosome 4. And chromosome 6 and chromosome 15 and their interaction all contribute to the explained variance. So if I drop the interaction, I lose 5% of the variance. Carl hates these, but I asked him to put them on. I always look for, depending on my mood, uh, three stars, sometimes two stars. Uh, these are just a measure of the statistical significance of, the, of dropping the terms one at a time in the model. So this is a model that I'm very happy with. This is actually the model of the data that you'll fit in the RQTL tutorial. I think I'm going to have time to do one last thing today. The other topics are, are great and I spent a couple hours on one of them, but I will uh, I'll defer them until another time when we're in the mood. I'd like to ask this question. Are there two QTLs on chromosome 1? Remember the genome scan that had two peaks on chromosome 1? Well, there it is, and there they are. And how am I going to decide whether or not I have two QTLs on chromosome 1? Well, the way to decide that is to fit a two QTL model to chromosome 1. And I've done that by computing my all pairwise scan, because my all pairs included all pairs on any place in the genome, including two positions on chromosome 1. And here I'm going to look at them. Chromosome 1, chromosome 1. Peak at 43, peak at 79. It looks like it's getting them about in the same place as the scan 1 did. Uh, so the best position for two QTLs on chromosome 1, if I have a full model, is uh, 43 and 79. But look, that interaction log score is, is nothing. There's no interaction. These are additive QTLs. Go over here. Well, positions didn't change much. It's 45 and 79. Those are the best positions. The additive log score is pretty good. It's 5. But look at the add v1. 1. 1.6. If this were 1.1 or 1.2 or less than 1, I'd say no way. There's not two QTLs. If this were three, two and a half even, even two, 
I'd, I'd say there are two QTLs. This is one of those real things that happens. I'd say the evidence here is equivocal at best. I don't have really strong support for two separate QTLs on chromosome 1, but I have a hint of support. And what I would do operationally is I would go into chromosome 1 saying to myself, there probably are two QTLs there and I just don't have enough evidence to support finding two QTLs. I think it's the nature of statistical evidence that it works this way. It only accepts a complicated model if the simpler ex if the complicated model is a much better explanation of the data than the simple model. So I don't know if there are two QTLs and I don't really have the ability to conclude that there are but operationally, I want to keep it in the back of my mind that there could be two QTLs on chromosome 1. That's a little bit of the um, reasoning.